Hi, everybody. Guys, Hi. thanks for joining me. Tough act to follow, but yeah. let's just kick off with the, the easy bit. Um, can you just each introduce yourselves briefly, uh, starting with you, Ryan? Sure, yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to be with you on another lovely day in London. Um, uh, CEO of CoinShares. CoinShares is a digital asset management business uh, located here in, in Jersey, London, New York, and in Sweden. Uh, we issue products uh, across three exchanges throughout Europe, exchange traded products, and we also have a series of private strategies that invest in the different areas of the digital assets uh, and blockchain ecosystem. So that's, that's us. Yeah, and I'm Kyle O'Connor. I'm with NASDAQ. I do anything crypto blockchain related, which could mean a lot of different things, um, and have worked with Ryan with our CoinShares products that are in Sweden and have done quite a bit of work with Crypto Compare as well. Uh, my name is Brian Liston. I'm the president of CCX. We offer multiple trading venues and settlement platform for digital assets, a spot market uh, called Seed Digital Commodities Market, which is live, a derivatives exchange, which is called Seed Ceph which will be uh, live in the next two to three months, subject to the CFTC in the United States. And then we offer a settlement layer, zero hash, which can settle uh, derivatives, options, and spot trading, post-trade. Haney Rajwan, uh, CEO of Amun. Uh, we're a Swiss-based issuer of crypto-backed exchange-traded products. Um, and uh, we have um, a few ETPs on the Swiss stock exchange. Fantastic. All right. Well. Going straight into the, the heart of the matter, uh, derivatives and exchange traded products. Um, can you give the audience a bit of a state of the market um, view, uh, like high level, but also kind of give us a bit of an insight into what's, what's currently missing and what you guys are working on uh, in the coming months to year? Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe, yeah, I'll start. Okay. I mean, it's interesting um, when you look at what's kind of bifurcating and existing now, as we're emerging into over the last 10 years, the digital assets have kind of burst onto the scene. We started very similar to the way that other commodities and kind of the hedge fund world started, where you emerge with a series of peripheral products that start with some smaller private type companies like BitMEXs and others that issue derivative type products. And that eventually makes its way onto some of the more regulated exchanges. Now, the problem is. As these legacy assets trade clear and settle very differently than the way that Crest, EuroClear, or, or the, the US entities settle and clear, what ends up happening is you have this kind of, these products that end up being a bit more synthetic in nature as they integrate with the legacy system. So in Europe here, we've, got, we've started with synthetic products. Um, now Hanny's group has some physical back products. Uh, in the US, we started with cash delivered futures uh, and derivatives, and I think What's missing now and what will eventually happen is that globally, I think you'll start to see physically delivered products, both uh, in a larger basis on the ETP side globally, so not just in Switzerland, uh, but in the, in, in the derivative side, uh, what's called physically delivered futures and derivatives that I think is an important maturation point uh, for our industry. So I think that's what's missing and that's how it's developed, at least from our view. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. And in the U.S. especially, I know that with NASDAQ customers, many of them are sort of waiting for option-type products to come out the same way that CME has done their futures products. Um, option-type products just allow people to hedge their positions a little bit better and to manage risk a little bit better than futures do. So I know that we're certainly hoping to be able to provide some type of op option-type product, whether it's on a basket, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's what have you. Um, but I also know, and to Ryan's point, certainly the physically delivered environment is getting a little crowded, especially in the US with the emergence of BACT and with RSX and with CME even talking about potentially trying to physically deliver their products as well. So as exciting as it is and as much better it would be to have a physically delivered product than cash settled, it is um, seemingly pretty saturated. But can, can, can we interpret what you're saying? There's a bit of a an announcement here from the, from the CME about options coming to the market soon? It's, uh, it was filed like last year, maybe. I mean, uh, it's not news. <laughs> okay. uh, but it is, you know, of course, a regulatory hurdle. Um, I think one thing that's important to kind of think about is the analogy to something like FX, where crypto really does represent or kind of uh, have a lot of sim similarities. FX is about a $5 trillion industry, 2% of it. Uh, that is traded per day is on a listed futures exchange. The rest of it is OTC, spot, uh, brokered, or some sort of off-exchange activity or off-listed uh, futures activity. And so crypto actually represents that pretty well. About $50 billion is traded on exchange today, per day. 
according to coin market cap uh, one of the presentations earlier today dis dismissed some of the data so you can kind of talk about that but the, the OTC market is supposed to be three times larger it's kind of hard to get good data but roughly three times larger so we actually look a lot like the standard flow I don't know if the listed futures market will ever be the behemoth it's always going to be this kind of dealer centric OTC environment where listed futures serve a purpose but will not necessarily be the dominant uh, venue to hedge um, state of the market I think is overall still quite early um, we talk about things in innovations like physically backed, which is important we have a physically backed product but it's only available in a small market for Swiss investors um, I think we if we take more of a macro view of it we liken crypto a lot to um, the development of the internet but sometimes we forget um, to compare it is it is crypto today the internet where it was in the 70s or the 80s or the 2000s, early 2000s, late 2000s? And I, I'm of the opinion that it's still quite early and a lot of the needed infrastructure is still being built. But it's, it's, like, it's, it's, ma it's also massively bullish to see you know, this, the first iterations of these products that have come out have had you know, very big success. So you, you look at even if they've been synthetic or cash delivered, um, they've had massive success, multiple year track record, volumes are increasing, AUMs increasing, and the entities that are trading these products are becoming more familiar with the market uh, and how it trades and the volatility around that. And that is a precursor for more mature products, to Hanny's point, that we're going to see over the next 10 years. And, I think and I'm, I'm not at all dismissing that uh, we could still be quite early. I mean, there, if you look at the uh, development of the internet, there were multiple billion dollar valued companies at each and every stage of that development. Um, they're just different companies doing different things. That's fair enough. Okay. Different opportunities. Yep. I think it's also, also worth it to point out that a lot of the asset classes that already exist are still pretty much in this stage. Fixed income trades pretty over the counter. Yep. You know, FX desks, to, to Brian's point, aren't that sophisticated. I think a lot of the time when we try to compare this being early days, we're looking at equities, but equities certainly isn't you know, the way that everything trades. A lot of things are still very over the counter. And it's not exactly, I think you, you mentioned that the products that have come out have been very successful. Do you mean derivatives or listed products or what? Because I think the one example I would look at is the SIBO delisting their future because I don't, ultimately I'm not sure the rationale, I have my own thesis, but they also are an owner of Hotspot which is a kind of an OTC marketplace, and they don't necessarily want to compete in what is probably a larger market to offer like an NDS, effectively OTC product, where I think that probably will end up going. I well, think, I think a, good, a good gauge of this is, if you look at the ETPs, and there's, there's two major ETP issuers of crypto today in the world, Ryan um, and CoinShares is one, we're the other. Um, the trading volumes are quite good. Hmm. We're the most traded ETP of any variety on the entire Swiss Stock Exchange. Your products trade exceptionally well with low spreads, etc. It's the highest so, traded product on the Stock Exchange. Exactly, and sometimes that surprises people based on how sometimes relatively the market caps could be lower than some of the companies on there, but it it turns over and it trades like crazy with low spreads, um, high availability, and that's a pretty good gauge of it, especially when you consider that. When you think about the history of ETF development, a lot of the early volume, a lot of the early success was not from institutional investors or, or pension funds. They came later. Mm -hmm. It was from traders, riding the momentum, having a better, easier vehicle to access it. And I think that's what we tend to see I, today. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a good leeway actually into probably describing how you think about the flows today to this market. You know, who's, what, what's the product engineering there for? Who does it benefit? And who do you think your end customer is really going to be? in the long run. So there's ways to split this up. Um, maybe one way you could, we could uh, uh, describe that is, is there primarily a, a US versus the rest in the way those, those products are going to be evolving? Uh, but also, I think your sense of where do you think about retail versus professional investors or institutional investors, um, that'd be, it'd be a good indication to, to know where you think that's going. I have an opinion. So I think the, um, again, looking back to FX, 70% total is derivatives, um, so roughly two to one. And that's a pretty standard uh, ratio across any asset when you look at it. Um, crypto is not anywhere near that yet. Um, I think a lot of people assume that when the Bitcoin futures on the CME came out, um, there was going to be this explosion. But a lot of participants in the crypto space didn't come early days, or at least at that time, from traditional finance. So they didn't have the commercial use cases of hedging. 
And I think that's still somewhat true today. The biggest use case uh, for hedging is maybe lending. And I think figuring out what the trade flow is will allow us to structure a product more focused. So people use the BitMEX perpetual swap to hedge against maybe selling a cash position and then buying back later. And then that allows you to kind of structure a trade around that. And I think that people now are starting to develop these commercial transactions. The 70% of trading activity in FX that is derivative, 68% of that is off exchange and it's commercial paper. It's best by borrowing or lending or hedging an international exchange rate. And that kind of commercial activity uh, is still being developed. But I think the products need to represent that a little you, bit more than they do right now. You make an interesting point about BitMEX, though. So your, your suggestion is that a, a, a key use case for BitMEX today and the existing flows is hedging, uh, is basically hedging positions. It's not Asian retail, for example, for lack of a... Of, 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 Certainly a portion of it, right? It keeps it liquid, but ultimately, if I'm a dealer, for example, and I've got some crypto, and I want some cash, I could sell the crypto, open a position on BitMEX, and then I'm hedged, use the cash, get cash back, maybe I borrow the, or lend the cash out, and then I can repurchase the crypto and exit my hedge on BitMEX, and I've sort of earned interest on crypto. So that's a trade that you can do. And I think that's a commercial trade. You can wrap that in a nice wrapper, and you can trade it as a swap. And so I think if you can think a little bit more about the commercial flow, you can structure derivatives. And I think right now there's maybe a bit of a gap. I mean, I, mean, I, I look at I, I agree with a lot of that. Some I don't agree with. I think a lot of BitMEX volumes is a, are the punters and speculators. I'm sure from your lens that, yes, you're right, all of those things are also true. But you know, BitMEX might be, in terms of derivatives, it might be the single most successful derivative product in the history of capitalism. I mean, especially on a, on a zero to 60 mile per hour basis in only a few years, right? So I mean, is there, what other derivative contract has gone from, not, from zero within five years to those types of volumes, right? It's unbelievable. So we look at it from... Euro dollar? The VIX, I mean, maybe? okay, so me, me, Euro dollar. I, I like to see those stats, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, how does BitMEX and Perpetual Swap compare against good, the five years of Euro yeah. dollar? So uh, in, in Asia, BitMEX is kind of dominating the derivatives market. The, the new group, um, a few more groups are popping up around them. In Europe, it's, it's interesting. In Europe, it's very heavy ETP uh, versus US, it's been much more futures. Uh, and and um, you know, I think in, in the ETP business, I'd say 80 to 90% of it's retail that can buy it directly out of their, um, out of their Hargraves Lansdowne's accounts or whatever else it might be. So we're seeing the construct of the market be much more retail focused, at least in Europe. While I think if you look at some of the CME vo volumes, you're seeing a lot more hedging use case from institutions that are structuring trades a bit more. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I, I definitely are. agree with that. And I think we would also be remiss to not mention the Grayscale products because they are so popular in the US. But it is a different brand of institutions that are buying those versus who is participating in the futures products. It's more family offices, you know, long biased. Um, players in the marketplace and with futures it is very much proprietary traders people hedging positions trading against each other it's not positions that you keep forever that just no. isn't what a futures product is but with with products like GBTC and like the things that are quoted over the counter those are something that you do want to hold for a long time so I do think when we say institutional I think a lot of times that's a little too broad given just the landscape in the US of how important it is to have market makers be able to back your product and prop it up. And that's why CME's product is so successful, because most of the people interacting with it are market making firms that know exactly what they're doing, that know how to provide liquidity, that can do it you know, with their eyes closed. Yeah. So I think it, it's important to make that distinction. I, I think you asked initially, is it the US versus the rest? I think it's actually much more siloed than that. Um, I think even in Europe, where the there are large ETP issuers, we still tend to uh, see a lot of usage coalesce around specific geographies. We're primarily, uh, almost exclusively, a Swiss-only product. Um, I know a lot of your use cases is in Scandinavia. We see a lot of, of similar uh, characteristics with specific countries in Asia. Um, Grayscale is primarily an American product. And so I think that because of regulations and because of the different nuances of audiences and geographies, um, it's not just the US versus the rest. It's, it's almost country by country, region by region, uh, different. OK, fair enough. And so but the, if I was going to summarize the, the views right here, it's like there is actually a huge retail component still in this derivatives market in its broader sense, uh, that there is some of a distinction between, between the US and the rest because of uh, a very meaningful amount of institutional flow, maybe on a relative basis in the US. 
Um, so looking at now like the, the, the broad global spectrum, where does institutional flow really come in? Is the use case therefore going to be just hedging? Uh, because that's premised upon genuine commercial use. Or do we actually have a big speculative creep from institutions in this market that's maybe going slightly unnoticed, but you know, we're looking at open interest on, on Deribit today. We're looking at the growth of the options market since probably the third quarter of last year, which is very recent. There's clear indicators of the fact that there's an enormous growth in actual in, in the in, in the tradings of, the, in the, in, of these instruments. So where do you think where do you think we are here in terms of institutional possibly speculative flow into the market? I think I think the first thing we have to specify though is what is institutional? Um, are is it traders that are riding the momentum that need to open hedge positions that are thinking about that? Is it family offices or pension funds and now? I'm, I'm, I'm happy I'm happy to kind of. Uh, propose a definition here and not institutional in terms of family offices in terms of large banks or because I think it's still consensual that these guys aren't at the table yet. They're primarily but I traders think if we're looking at like the professional traders the prop shops that's the guys that I'm referring to when I'm saying institutional and I would separate those from retail as we've kind of uh, alluded to it whether it's in Asia or, or Europe for that matter. I, mean, I, I personally think we're a long ways off. I mean, I, I, I hear for four years now, I've been hearing the institutions are coming, the institutions are coming. And, you know, the Bitcoin itself is unique because it's a grassroots movement. You know, there's no question that we're getting more mature and there's no question that uh, the counterparty risk is diminishing in terms of the type of entities that are providing services and access to this market. But in terms of the net new demand that's being driven for appetite of expressing a view into Bitcoin itself, I don't see a massive, I, I don't see um, the, up, the, the top end of the food chain where investment decisions are in a board level. It becomes much more about uh, losing your job than it does necessarily finding the most abstract thing to bet on. And I think Bitcoin is still very much an abstract narrative and investment class. So I think personally we're a, we're a ways away. Now that's not to say that we certainly have institutions that own our products, quite a few, and Morgan Stanley and all these other groups offer access to it, but in terms of net new demand for Bitcoin over the next two years, I don't see it coming from institution. I think there's a massive amount of retail that is going to continue to drive this up into the 50,000, 100,000 range, and maybe then we'll see institutions come in, but I just don't, I don't buy it. I'm not seeing it. I, I agree with that, and I think, and I know that this is not a regulatory panel, but it, people mostly follow the U.S. in regulation, and we're now entering a, an area where both regulators are undergoing turnover who's at the top. So Giancarlo's already stepped down, and the new guy is coming in, and Jay Clayton's term is almost up as well. Neither one of them are going to make a big decision on this while they're still there. They're I mean, just my, not going to. My partner, Meltem Demers, gets m like 50 times more interest from the private strategies and, and, and funds that she invests into, into the equities of these companies than we do you know, a, a, a 500, 600 million liquid uh, exchange traded product exclusively on Bitcoin. So it tells you um, kind of where the, at least that's, that's what I'm seeing in the, in the thousands of clients that we talk to a year. But maybe you guys have something different. That's just from my perspective what I'm seeing. I, I think generally crypto works on a condensed timeline, right? The speed at which the market can rally, the, the scale at which it can rally to in, in that period makes everything feel very fast, but institutional groups in traditional markets are not fast. They take years to just integrate. Uh, you can look at an FX trading platform. The largest have, say, 300 clients. They've been around for a decade, and it's taken a decade to get 300 people connected. You look at the largest crypto exchanges, they've got 20 million clients, most of them retail, but not all of them. Um, it's coming through web interface and everything else. It takes a year or two to get a bank on board. And so if you think about the last few years, 2017 was probably the first year any of these groups would pay attention to crypto because it was actually size, um, driven by hype and ICO. 2018, we have this bear market, but people really start to invest. 2019, you start to see the fruits of some of that labor, right? You start to see back, you see we're getting regulated, we're gonna be launching a physically settled forward contract, which is margined, and that allows you to structure things. Um, but the reality is it's not gonna be until 2020, but there's so many things in, in the pipe, so many move, movements and so many players that it is happening. It's just that I think people, 
generally in crypto, working on such a condensed, condensed timeline, assume that the rest of the world operates at that timeline I mean, too. I, I feel like, despite the fact that I'm just uh, the moderator here, I've got to chime in as, as a trading firm as well. When I was talking about the kind of institutional participants in this market, what I was implicitly referring to was the kind of market makers and the prop shops that are very active. And I think like our experience has been that actually there is an enormous amount of speculative flow going into derivatives today yeah. because as the exchanges are becoming more efficient, as pricing becomes tighter, those the margins that a lot of the existing traders, professional traders have been deriving from the market are narrowing. So that suddenly derivatives constitutes a new opportunity because pricing is more inefficient, because the kind of potential returns are higher. And my, my suggestion really was that actually you do have a, a, a key driver of the growth of this market has been your crypto institutionals uh, driving some of their flows into the derivatives market because the spot markets have been picked clean effectively. But we don't have to quite agree about this without, but, but what we could talk about though is how you wish, wish to think about risk in either of those scenarios, right? So I guess there's two areas of risk. You've got the kind of implied leverage that comes with the growth of the derivative market and you've got counterparty risk. How do you guys think about that in a world where it's actually quite hard to track, especially if a lot of the flows OTC? Uh, the growth of the market, and it's also difficult to evaluate what counterparty risk looks like when you don't have a central clearing counterparty, for example, or even uh, utilize ISDA kind of structure uh, to protect people, uh, to, uh, to protect counterparties. How do you think about that? I think there ends up being two different types of product, right? Um, counterparty risk, those kinds of risks are elevated. Um, with specific trading patterns. Um, they are less with uh, exchange-traded products that are a bit more visible. They're more on background OTC um, types of trades. And so I think we, we will see um, the market sort of elevate the risk on one end. Um, we were talking about 100x leverage, right, yeah. uh, earlier. Um, things like that will not come to the, the market or the exchange in a public way for a long, long time. But that level of heightened risk will happen in other ways. And so two very different types of things based on the products here. I think one thing, which is uh, how you bring in those groups that take a long time to integrate, is building the post-trade infrastructure. And this takes care of kind of the risk management as well. So if you have a trading platform that has a lot of connected clients, they trade FX, how do you get them trading crypto? Right now, when they trade, they deliver a trade to a, a prime broker or some sort of post-trade facility. FX doesn't really clear centrally too much. It's mostly primes and these liquidity pools. That doesn't really exist in crypto. Um, I mean, we've built zero hash, which serves in that capacity. What any group can do is deliver us a trade, and we will margin it. We will hold collateral for both sides. We can pay variation margin back and forth between participants. And so you need to have this kind of mark-to-market -market capability um, and a place to house a trade. And that allows you to cover things like default risk, replacement cost risk. Um, and so you just need more of that post-trade infrastructure. I think a lot of the spot markets in crypto trade and settle together. But actually, you can split those two things out, have a trading platform, and deliver the settlement to a settlement agent, which we, we could be uh, and we serve as for us, some groups. Um, or for example, CME has CME Clear, which clears their futures product. So you, these, these pipes are, are, are getting built. Um, we just need to have a place to house the trade. And ultimately, right now, it's so bilateral that that's kind of an inhibitor to, to the development of proper risk management and just derivatives in general. I'm probably going to be the outlier here, but I sort of roll my eyes a little bit when people ask about risk in this marketplace because NASDAQ operates a futures exchange and we clear through OCC. And we operate oil futures, which is arguably the most corrupt market in the world. And the margin isn't nearly as high for oil futures as it is for the Bitcoin futures that Siba had to clear through them. So for me, it's just, it's, it, it's mostly it just doesn't make sense to me why people think these are so much riskier than everything else that people trade. Trading is inherently risky no matter what you're doing. So I think it's more of a common sense thing than anything. I think, I think that risk comes from uh, some of the imperfection and information that's available to the market. In a world where a lot of it is bilateral OTC trading, it is difficult to evaluate actually how much risk is potentially ballooning. Um, but, but most of these derivative products are fully collateralized. So there's not necessarily a lot of risk there. Which is actually, I think, like an the inhibitor. Counterparty risk is a, a lot bit exaggerated yeah. in a number of these transactions purely because of the structure. 
I think the fully collateralized model is a friction, actually. So yeah, I mean, no one wants to do that. No, no one, one wants to put up that much capital to no. trade these products. Exactly. So I mean, our margin product, our physically settled forward contract will be margined, right? And therefore, you have to build this margin capability, pairing variation back and forth. Um, I think the biggest thing is margin needs to be high. Um, I, again, avoiding reg, but there are standards you have to set in different countries around margin and the number of days it needs to cover uh, in terms of a potential loss. And so if you're trying to cover, say, five days of potential loss in crypto, when in one day it can move 30%, as it did like three weeks ago, um, those margins st start to tick up. Uh, 100x leverage product is a gambling product. It is built to get liquidated. And so it's just a different structure. Um, who, who's your target audience? OK, so nothing to worry about just yet. There's no bubble that's kind of creeping up on us like it did in 17. And uh, tons of fantastic products to look forward to. Um, do you think that ultimately then we're turning into an increasingly centralized infrastructure when it comes to the way this market is going to function then? No. I mean, if you look at right now, 16.8% of Bitcoin is held by uh, custodians or third-party intermediaries. And I think that number will probably stay around the same in terms of relative, uh, at that percentage, in terms of the relative supply. Um, what will start maybe accelerating that a little bit is the concept of interest rates. So this is a very positive thing. The fact that we're starting to get a natural interest rate around Bitcoin for lending it out is one of the most bullish things that could happen. Because what happens, just because you're keeping Bitcoin at a custodian for yourself uh, to develop Bitcoin in interest terms, does not mean that you're counteracting or uh, you're using some paradoxical approach to how, what Bitcoin was created for, which is being your own bank. That's not necessarily true. Bitcoin was important because it separated the issuance of money from the state. That was the real revolution here. In terms of what you do in the development of a financial market and financial services, lending and custody will always be there. So the, the, the thing that I'm most excited about over the next five years is the development of Bitcoin's natural interest rate. So you're going to see a per block interest rate develop, which is, will be equivalent to like the money market interest rate. That will be probably defined from what the Lightning Network staking prices are. Then you'll see hourly, daily, weekly, monthly rates, and there'll be a nice curve to that. And that will help develop, will be interest rate derivatives, interest rate futures, and all of these things will help develop Bitcoin as, a, uh, as an asset class and the market infrastructure will accelerate the adaptation and people to express different views. So the interest rate market, I think, is one of the most bullish things and the derivatives around the interest rate will start to take set after that. And the fact that it's not able to be manipulated by eight people sitting in an office globally and it can develop its own commercial rate is the single most bullish thing that could possibly happen in finance, in my opinion. Even more important than, or I'd say just as important as separating the issuance of Bitcoins from, from the state, is to let an interest rate develop, commercial interest rate develop naturally. Fantastic. Um, I would say that I'm looking forward to the uncoupling of custody with liquidity providers. So right now, most of the exchanges are completely vertically integrated. If, and if you wanted to interact with a different type of liquidity, you're kind of out of luck. You have to have accounts everywhere. Um, and I think if I really liked a certain type of custody solution, but I wanted to interact with other liquidity, that I should be able to do that. That is how Nasdaq's liquidity works now. You can have an account at TD Ameritrade or Schwab or E-Trade or whatever, and you can still trade Nasdaq stocks. So I'm actually hoping to sort of converge into that and to get rid of the vertically integrated world. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, the interest rate, I, I think, is actually a really interesting point. One of the things that we've seen as an interest for the physical product are miners setting up a physical delivery regime every month and effectively locking in your price. You can then let, borrow against that, and your cost of capital and the repayment on that cash can be uh, locked in pretty securely. That's effectively a bond, and you can sell and buy these kind of little LLC, these mining rigs, effectively like a secured uh, bond transaction. And I think that kind of development, that kind of engineering is, is super interesting. So we're just excited to see the, the commercial use cases of derivatives kind of start to come to fruition and just being a part of it. Overall, I'm bullish, but on a more negative note, um, I fear about the siloing of the different markets. I fear about the different types of regulations. And I fear about how, despite crypto being a global phenomena, um, products that are linked to it are too focused on specific nation states and their specific um, monetary authorities. And that 
will stymie innovation a little bit and potentially uh, make this take a little bit longer than most people I think. I felt like I was going to wrap this up with a super <laughs> bullish view and you can be like steady crash from down. <laughs> Basically, I, I think it inevitably will get there. I just think this will take longer than most people um, realize. Yeah. I guess it feels like echoes of the previous panel where at the end of it, customer protection is a nationally defined kind of, kind, of, kind of concept. So what gets traded in any jurisdiction is really going to be a function of what local regulators allow. Precisely. But anyhow, I think we've run out of time now. So I'd like to thank you all, guys all very, very much uh, for your time. And you. uh, thanks to the audience for uh, staying with us. Thank you.